Hare 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 Hare
I'm not coming. <laughs> His mother calls him. <laughs> I'm playing. I don't care about eating. I'm <laughs> yeah, it happens like that. His mother calls him, doesn't come. We all know that. We, our mother calls us and we don't listen either. So that's, we, we get that from Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> it's in fact everything we do is that is within the confines of acceptability it comes from Krishna <laughs> okay so Srimad Bhagavatam Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So we're reading from Canto 2, Chapter 10. This is the last verse in the entire Bhagav uh, second canto, 51. And the chapter is Bhagavatam is the answer to all questions. Suta Uvacha Rajnan Padik Sito Prastahu Ya 
Rajna Prasna Na Sarataha Sutta Uvacha Rajna Pariksita Prastoho Yadavo Chan Mahamunahi Tadvo Bixbas Ye Srinuta Rajna Prasisana pra, Rajna Prasna Nusarataha Sutta Ovacha Rajna Prariksita Prasno Yadavochan Mahamunahi Tadvo Bixbas Ye Srinuta Rajna Prasna Nusarataha Ladies. Sutta Ovacha Sutta Uvacha, <coughs> Sri Sutta Goswami replied, Rajnya, by the king, Pariksita, by Pariksit, Prishta, as asked, Yat, 
what Avojat spoke, Mahamunihi, the great sage, taught that very thing, Va, unto you, Abhidasye, I shall not. Ex I shall explain. Srinuta, please hear. Rajnya, by the king. Prashnya, question. Anusarataha, in accordance with. So, Sutta Goswami explains. So he's summarizing now all of the questions that. Uh, the, uh, is being asked, asked to um, uh, Sukadeva Goswami, yeah, and by Maharaj Pariksit. Sutta Goswami explained, I shall now explain to you the very subjects explained by that great sage in answer to King Pariksit's inquiries. Please hear them attentively. Mm -hmm. Again. Sut Sri Sutta Goswami explain, I shall now explain to you the very subjects explained by that great sage in answer to King Pariksit's inquiries. Please hear them attentively. Very short purpur, purpur, purport, so please listen up. Any question that is put forward may be answered by quoting the authority, and that satisfies the saner section. That is the system even in the law court. The best lawyers give evidence from the past judgment of the court without taking much trouble to establish his case. This is called parampara system, and learned authorities follow it without manufacturing rubbish, rubbish interpretations. Ishwara Parama Krishna Satchit Ananda Vigraha Anadir Adir Govinda Sarvakarna Karna. That's from the first verse of Brahma Samhita. Last line Let us all obey the Supreme Lord, whose hand is in everything without exception. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purports of the second canto, tenth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Bhagavatam is the answer to all questions. End of second canto. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gina Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Smayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dada Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Pancha Kalpa Taru Vischa Kripa Sindhu Pebacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnave Bio Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Nityananda Dvaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gor Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. So, it's a very succinct but very important statements that are made, being made here, that knowledge, real knowledge, comes from the bona fide authority. And the bona fide authority, as it's mentioned, or ends in this purport, is Krishna. And another name for Krishna is Adi Guru. He is the original source of all knowledge. And all the gurus that come in the line of Krishna are actually getting their knowledge ultimately from Krishna. Krishna is called, I mean, scripture is called a parushad, which means not man-made. It's made only by God. It's not, comes from this material world. 
So authority comes from the perfect authority, or knowledge comes from the perfect authority. And anything we want to know, we have to go through the perfect authority. But there's always, especially in this age, there's always conflict of authorities. And therefore, um, just like for instance, Srila Prabhupada said that we never went to the moon. <laughs> but the whole world, and particularly the United States of America, was celebrating the moon landing back in the late 1960s. <laughs> But Prabhupada came on, on uh, radio in Los Angeles interview and he said, we never went to the moon. And the moon is a higher planet. And to go there, you have to qualify yourself. You just can't go into any, any mechanical way and go there. And, uh, and of course, that was quite revolutionary at the time when everyone was saying we went to the moon. But Srila Prabhupada wasn't fooled by the scientific adventures that people they were putting out on the news. And later on, books were written out. One book was called The Moon Hoax, <laughs> that others were writing based on doing research and found out, yeah, we never went to the moon. So here you, Prabhupada said, well, I got my authority from, from Scripture. Scripture says that the moon is a higher planet. And to elevate oneself to a higher planet, you have to qualify yourself. Just like when you go from place to place in this world, you need some kind of documents, passports, this visa, or something, to allow you to enter into another country, what to speak about another planet, <laughs> which means is a whole different karmic collection of there. In other words, you have to have that karma to qualify yourself to enter into higher le levels of existence. And so Prabhupada used uh, his argument based on Bhagavata. And he said many other things that were also in contrary to what modern authorities were saying in terms of what is actually true. And so, but Prabhupada always came back to the same idea that we're taking knowledge from the perfect authority. We may not be perfect, but if we, and Prabhupada used a very simple example. The child doesn't know much, but if he hears from his father, then he can speak in an authoritative way what his father speaks, even though he's only a child. So, in order to understand things, we have to go to the perfect source. Now, Kali Yuga is designed in such a way that one of the principles, and not only a principle, but the main principle of Kali Yuga is don't follow authority. Become your own authority. In other words, you can decide you're, you're intelligent, and you can make your own decisions in any, all, any and all aspects of life. Therefore, just throw out this idea of authority. But what Kali Dua does is it's establish his own authority of no authority. <laughs> We're listening to Kali. <laughs> Kali's voice is that, you know, you are able and qualified and you can make your own decisions on anything. So you don't have to listen to your parents, you don't have to listen to any persons who have positions in, in authority in society, just do whatever you want to do. And that gets people to, you know, to just, it becomes chaotic that everybody has an opinion, everybody has an idea and everybody sort of works in that way. And therefore there is so many opinions <laughs> about the same thing. Most of them are all just what I think or what I want to think. Prabhupada said, yeah, Bhagavad Gita as I see it. <laughs> Not Bhagavad Gita as it is. Prabhupada said there were 646 editions of Bhagavad Gita when he, he was here on the planet. Since then it's increased to over 700. And, uh, and they're all claiming to sp speak the words of Bhagavad Gita, but each one has its own angle of presentation. And Prabhupada explained that uh, until we actually represented Krishna the way Krishna wanted to be represented, there wasn't really any genuine followers of Bhagavad Gita. 
Only when Bhagavad Gita, as it is, came out, then we had something. So for us, where do we get our authority? We get our authority from Shri Prabhupada's books. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, if you want to know me, and you want to know what is actually the truth, because I'm getting that knowledge from Krishna, which is coming through the perfect disciplic succession. So he said, if you want to know me, if you want to know this process of bhakti, read my books. <laughs> and so reading Prabhupada's books, everything becomes clear. And if we don't read the books, then we can, we can hear from different persons and we may also have our own, can make our own conclusions based on what is convenient or what seems to be the truth. Therefore, and Prabhupada said so many things. And in the books, there also appears to be, but not really, a contradictions in certain statements. But when you listen to his lectures or you read his letters, you uh, or you hear or you hear his room conversations, he deals with the situation accordingly and is giving the perfect answer according to the discussions that's going on or according to the person he's talking to. But he said, "From my books are for everyone. They're, my books are for everyone. So he said, if you want to know me, read my books. And that is the perfect authority because what Prabhupada is saying is actually coming from his spiritual master who's getting it from his spiritual mass all the way back to Srila Rupa Goswami, who's our actually Abhideya Acharya. He teaches the process of pure devotional service because he received that knowledge from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So there's no question, the devotees know everything <laughs> because we have the access to everything there right in front of us in the form of Srila Prabhupada's books. All we have to do is read these books. But we don't read the books, that's the problem. <laughs> and that's one of the problems in our society. We don't read Prabhupada's books enough. And Prabhupada said, read my books one hour, two hours, five hours a day. Read these books, and he said, bodhiyantas parasparam katiyantas chamam richam. Study these books, discuss these books, understand them from different angles of vision and learn how to apply that knowledge in the practical life. And by doing that, the understanding comes and the realization also comes. And that's how Krishna consciousness unfolds in a philosophical way. So we have our classes in the morning and I guess our classes in the evening. But Prabhupada said our temples should be educational institutions where we read my books all the time, he was saying. And he, he said four books are important. Nectar of Devotion, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and at the time, it wasn't Chaitanya Charita Rita, it was teachings of Lord Chaitanya, which now is expanded into the life of Lord Chaitanya, Chaitanya Charita Rita. He says these four books comprise all the knowledge completely that you cannot exhaust even for many, many lifetimes. And Prabhupada was on a morning walk with Professor Durkheim from Germany. The professor was very gentlemanly, very, he liked Prabhupada, he spoke very nicely to Prabhupada and asked him many questions. And Prabhupada was talking about Bhagavatam. And he said, in Bhagavatam there are 18,000 verses. And it takes one month to eat, understand each verse. And then he looked at his disciples, how long is that? And one of his disciples was quite good. He said, that's 1,500 years. And he said, you have enough to read. <laughs> so we, uh, we could read Bhagavatam over and over again and still we won't be able to scratch the surface of this unlimited knowledge because spiritual knowledge is dynamic. It's not static. The more you read it, or the more you're exposed to it, the more it reveals itself to you. And as you make advancement in Krishna consciousness, you see more and more things. Just like last night, I was at someone's house. And we were talking, he was talking about a particular rice. 
of that is a rare rice in India. It's called Nivara rice. Maybe some of the ladies heard of it. Nivara rice. It's in the Bhagavatam. It's mentioned in one of the translations. This rice was cooked by Sukuntala when she was living at Kava Muni's ashram when her future husband, Bart Maharaj, who became her husband later, came to, uh, to meet her. And she cooked this Nivara rice. You know, I must have read Bhagavatam so many times, I never saw that. <laughs> so when you actually really get into Bhagavatam, you find finer and finer things. And this rice is so special that if you eat it, it's three times more powerful in nutrition than any other rice. It's hard to find. It comes from Kerala, mostly. <laughs> anyway, that's another subject. <laughs> but the point is that these little, little incidents or little innuendos in Bhagavatam, there's so many little things that you cannot see unless you read over and over, or even people show you. Bhagavatam is amazing. And therefore, Prabhupada used to say, you know, just read my books, you'll understand everything. But he did say also, and discuss the books. So Prabhupada said his books would be the law books for the next 10,000 years. So that means everything that we want to know or every situation that comes up in terms of the practice of Krishna consciousness or the challenges we make, we face in our execution of devotional service, all the answers are there. We don't, sometimes we think we have to come up with new ideas and new ways and so many things. But that's just, that is just this idea that somehow or other Prabhupada didn't give us everything. But he covered everything. Details. Not only the subject matters, but the subject matters and details. And if you read, you'll see that. Of course, even when you listen to Srila Prabhupada, he will also explain what he wrote in his books, in his lectures, which will open up the books even more. So we have um, enough, and ultimately, but sometimes we need a little help to understand Prabhupada's books. So what we do is we go to our spiritual master or someone who is on the level of our spiritual master, and we ask them the questions because in that position of being spiritual master, they're supposed to and are qualified to be able to lead others by giving that transcendental knowledge. Guru Mukha Padma Vakya Chichete Kodiya Oikin. That knowledge is like nourishment. What is that other part of that? Chaksudan Dilo Ye Janmi Janmi Prabhu Dibya Gyan Ridde Prakasita Dibgyan. What is that Dibgyan? Transcendental knowledge. He, the spiritual master, injects spiritual knowledge into the mind and heart of a devotee, and that becomes a feature of the devotee's character. That knowledge is no longer something out there. It becomes you. You actually start to live the knowledge. When you live the knowledge, that is called realization or vigyan, or that means understanding. So that ver that statement, divya gyan, what is that divya gyan? So if I... I, I Okay, I'll ask the question, what is that divgya that Prabhupada is referring to in that verse? Or actually, Naratam Das Thakur is singing. What is that divgya? Who knows? Hmm? What, what it, div, divya means transcendental and gyan means not. A, what is that divya gyan that it, that's being referred to? It's specific. What is that? Well, what is that realization? Hmm? That's nice and it's true, but it doesn't refer to that in that statement. What is that transcendental knowledge that is pure and perfect, that is intrinsic in your understanding of your relationship? Hmm? Hmm? You're getting close. He said connection between you and Krishna. So what is that connection? The divgyan is you belong to Krishna. 
not to anything else, <laughs> not to your society, your family, your computer. You belong to Krishna. That's how Prabhupada translates that. The divyagyan is you belong to Krishna. Ultimately, in other words, we have an eternal loving relationship with Krishna that's never lost, never broken, just forgotten. That's all. So when the spiritual master gives you that divyagyan, that's the beginning of you getting back to your actual constitutional position of eternal servant to Krishna which leads you back to the spiritual world. <laughs> so, therefore, we need to unpack this knowledge. And not only we hear it, but we also need to explain it. Because a lot of times Prabhupada said so many things. Prabhupada, just like this one thing that Prabhupada said, and people criticize Prabhupada a lot for this. And I've seen devotees leave the movement because of this. Prabhupada gave some credit to Hitler. He said Hitler was a gentleman. Now what, why did Prabhupada say Hitler was a gentleman? What was, a, what was gentlemanly about Hitler that Prabhupada thought was enough to, uh, important? Huh? Right. He had the atomic bomb, but he didn't use it. He didn't use it on London, right. He didn't use it. That's why you guys are still here. <laughs> no. No, and he didn't use it on, well, he didn't use it. Prabhupada said he didn't use it at all. But the Americans, right after the, uh, Japan surrendered, they wanted to use the bomb. The, the war was over, but they dropped it on Nagasaki and Hiroshima and killed tens and thousands hundreds of thousands of people with those bombs. And therefore Prabhupada said Hitler was a gentleman. But then again, we understand who Hitler was. He was, you know, who he was. He, he is, but he was, Prabhupada was making that point. So unless you really understand, hearing from Prabhupada and understanding Prabhupada is sometimes like two parts of the conclusion. So we have to, when we read the books, we try to have to understand what Prabhupada is saying in his purports and in, even in, in translating the translations. Otherwise, we may speculate. And if it's clear, it's clear. And Prabhupada made it as clear as he could. Because when he was doing his Bhaktivedanta translations, uh, or tra what was it, what's the word, not translation, I used the wrong word, not translations. Tra yeah. Transcriptions, yeah. He was, when he was taking what the Acharyas had given him in the form of Bhagavatam, and he was adding his own realizations, and then he was presenting that as the Bhaktivedanta purports. And Prabhupada's idea was to speak to the Western mentality because he knew that we wouldn't be able to understand if he spoke according to the pure Vedic explanations. So he, he broke it down to, uh, to make it understandable to the Western mentality. And still, we can't understand it. <laughs> so we need some help to understand, and there's where our spiritual master comes in. So our spiritual master is the, uh, gives us, he helps us understand what Prabhupada is giving us. Because we don't have a direct, we have a direct relationship with Srila Prabhupada, that is true, with his books. But he's not here to answer our questions. So our questions are answered by his representatives based on what Srila Prabhupada has said, and that everything becomes clear. And that way we can understand deeper, you know, what we need to know, in fact, in the execution of devotional service. But Kali is always telling you, forget authorities. Just simply become your own authority. And that's the death of uh, good, uh, real authority. Therefore, we have to read Srila Prabhupada's books. 
And what did Prabhupada say before he left? He said, he said, 50% of my mission is unfinished. Now that's a pretty bold statement. 50%. That means out of the time he was here, he was only able to accomplish 50%. What was that 50%? He spread the holy name. He translated the books and distributed the books. He opened temples. He educated devotees and brought them to the stage of initiation where they could actually be performing Vaishnav culture. But he said, we don't have a social system. And we need that social system. In 1974, up before 1974, Prabhupada said, forget Van Ashram. We can't establish Van Ashram. Society is too mixed up. But then in 1974, Prabhupada completely changed and said, he said, now we have to establish this Daivi Van Ashram, spiritual Van Ashram. And then he questioned, because Prabhupada had said, just chant Hare Krishna, that's enough. But then Prabhupada said, if chanting Hare Krishna is so easy, then why are so many devotees falling down? They're chanting Hare Krishna, but they're going away. Why? Because we don't have a social system in order to engage our devotees according to their proclivities and their nature. So he said, we have to establish this Vanarsha. In 1977, he spoke about it a lot, especially in, to Satcharup Maharaj, to Hari Sari, and many times after that. He said, this, this system is, you can't establish it in the cities. He said, the cities are too topsy-turvy. You can only do it on the farms. So he said, build these farms. And then, build, then set up a college by which you can teach the varnas. He said the brahmanas, those who were qualified brahmanas that had already you know, shown their qualifications in our society would be the teachers for the other varnas. They would teach the kshatriyas how to fight, how to manage, and how to give in charity to those who are worthy to receive it. The vaishyas would grow crops, keep cows, do banking, commerce, and organize the, what do we call the, what is the basic principle for health and for food, which is needed by everyone. And Prabhupada said, if we can establish this Van Ashram system, then our movement will fast travel around the world. And devotees will be engaged according to their nature and be very created, enthusiastic in their Krishna consciousness. And he said, especially for the farms, that is based for, that is for the grihastas, he said. The grihastas need a stable environment to raise children and to live their livelihood. They're not so mobile. The sannyasis, the brahmacharis, they're more mobile. They can go from place to place and somehow continue in their service. But grihastas need stab stability in their livelihood. So he said the farms are for the grihastas. Like that, and he said, the first thing you should do is provide food. He said, grow your own food. He said, the food you get on the market. He said, the food you grow in your own temples in your own on your own farms, hundred times more nutritious than what you can get in the stores. And especially today, with all the herbicides and pesticides and various types of chemicals. The, the water's polluted, the air's polluted, the, the atmosphere is polluted by, by noise. Papa said, establish these farms and keep cows. You're doing it here, and it's wonderful. When I come to this area, I know I can get good milk. This milk is coming from our cows. Because the milk you get in the, the commercial dairies if you take the ones you get in the commercial dairies, you put it in the refrigerator, and then you milk the cow here and put it in the refrigerator, the one from the store left lasts two weeks <laughs> because it's full of all kinds of other ingredients to keep it long-lasting, la therefore it's artificial. <laughs> so he said, and cows, of course, um, there's so much cows provide 
I mean, maybe some of you have grown up in India and lived in that very simple village life. But I was given this lecture, and one, I was talking about the benefits of cows, that Lakshmi Devi, it says in the scripture, exists within cow dung. And Prabhupada said, if you cook by cow dung, everything becomes nice, becomes very fragrant, and your food even tastes better. He said, first class cooking. When I was in New Vrindavan, and I was cooking there, we were cooking with wood. We had no gas, which was pretty good. And Prabhupada said, cow dung first, wood second, gas third. And what's that other thing we do? Electric. One lady, she was very sick, and the doctor told her, don't cook on your electric stove, it'll make you more sicker. <laughs> so electric is not so very... You know, it's also raping the environment, too. So, cow dung. And then if you take cow dung and you put it, process it through certain machines, I don't know what they call them, you can make methane gas, and you can heat your own home. And you can also provide it for the various types of heating. Become, you don't have to pay big heating bills. <laughs> So Prabhupada showed in a very practical way, n not only from the material point of view, but actually the spiritual point of view, that this livelihood on the farms is actually doable and more practical. And he also said, in 1973, he said that this Western civilization in 50 years will be finished. <laughs> and it's crashing right now. <laughs> if you don't, just, just look what's happening. It's going down fast. So he could foresee that eventually Western civilization, he said the reason why it'll crash, because it's based on a false premise, it's called money. Money is not a foundation for, for existence. Money, if you have money, you can do things. You have money, you can cover all of your mistakes. But money is not a foundation. Culture, education, of course, spirituality, values, morality, aesthetics, qualities of the human being and not money is the foundation for a progressive society. And Prabhupada gave a whole formula which he wanted us as a society to build, to continue not only our society, but to attract the greater society to that, that style of life. And right now, they're ahead of us. <laughs> they're way ahead of us. They're actually moving out of the cities and going into the forest. The only problem with that, there's no center. We have the center. Our center is Krishna or the activities of devotional service, which keeps everything moving towards progress, both material and, and spiritually. We keep Krishna in the center. But back to cows. This is a very interesting thing. You want to hear something? I was giving this lecture in a couple places around America. I was talking about cows and how people were keeping cows in the village. So one man said, yes, Maharaj, you know, when I was in the village, um, if someone in the and someone in the in the village would get sick, they would go over to the cow and whisper in the cow's ear, and say that this person is sick, and uh, and then they and then the cow would hear that and then the cow would go, and look for the herb in the area that was the cure for that disease, and she would eat that and they would milk that and that milk would be given as the cure for the disease. Amazing. And then another, I said the same thing in another lecture in another place, and one man said, it's not like that, Maharaj. You don't have to tell the cow. She knows. <laughs> she knows who's sick, and she'll go and she'll eat, she'll look for that herb, and, you know, and then it'll work in that same way. Yeah. And so you, you can forget about, not forget about, but you can minimize your doctor bills. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, learn herbs and make medicines. He said all the cures in is in nature. Krishna has provided everything for every disease, including cancer and whatever other disease that we haven't experienced yet. It's all there in nature. When I was in New Taliban, in New Orleans, I was with one devotee. He set up his own herb business. And he, go, he, he goes into the forest, he knows, he knows the different plants, he studies them, and he extracts the plant, and then he takes the essence of the plant, mixes it with some tincture, 
and he creates a medicine based on that. And so Prabhupada said, yeah, learn herbs and, you know, apply medicine that way. You can reduce your doctor bills. Guess what the, guess what the third leading cause of death in the United States is today? Mm -hmm. Doctors, right, he's right. The third leading cause of death in the United States today is the cure that the doctors give you when you go to get cured. This is a statistic, not by some underground people, but by the Food and Drug Administration, the National Health Society in America. 15,000 people a month, a month, die from the cures that the doctors give them. Adibo, this is, this is amazing. It's on, it's on record. Yeah. So, um, Hare Krishna. <laughs> So Prabhupada wanted us to have everything we needed within the society based on, you know, what, what is required for livelihood. But he also said that living on the farms or a more simplified life, then you'll have more time and you'll have more and the proper atmosphere for spiritual life. Of course, we still go to the cities to preach. But Prabhupada said for every city temple, there should be a farm community to provide. He said, t t take the milk you get from the farms and the vegetables and the fruits you get from make and bring them into the city temples, open up a restaurant and give nice, tasty prasadam to people in general and they will become devotees simply by eating. <laughs> That's a fact. So, both from livelihood and from a, a preaching point of view, these farms are actually foundational. So, Prabhupada put a lot of emphasis on that. So, so, we haven't got to that point yet. We haven't been able to put enough time emphasis, and especially priority, in fulfilling Prabhupada's un part of the unfinished business, and that is establishing for of course they're doing it here but still has a way to go we need more agriculture here <laughs> where you can provide enough food for not only for all the devotees but for the entire congregation <laughs> and the land is there it just needs to be developed it just needs to be developed and so uh, and with the high food prices and the high fuel prices and people are stretched in order to and People were standing in food lines, I think, in I think the beginning of this year, just to get food in, in, the, in the UK. Things that could be... So Prabhupada could foresee that we need to establish this. So, so this was a big part of his mission. And the reason why I'm saying it is because I, it's been pushed in the background. And we're doing whatever else we're doing, which is good. We're, we're, we're distributing books and Prabhupada wanted that. He said that is the main way we can preach Krishna consciousness through book distribution. We're spreading the holy name. Krishna consciousness is growing around the world. There's no doubt about that. Just like this, this Ratha Yatra we just had a couple days ago. It was the, one of the biggest attendance we, in, on record for, um, for... And the weather wasn't even good. <laughs> I was watching, people were standing in the rain just taking darshan of the deities with their umbrellas. Some people didn't even have umbrellas. They were standing in the rain. It was a pretty, it was a really powerful Rathiyatra. I mean, I've been to, I usually come every year. But this year there were so many people that were actively participating. So Krishna consciousness is really moving. But we still need this social system in order to solidify our activities in such a way that devotees can live easily without having to struggle so much by plugging into this Western industrial civilization that really takes all your time, energy, and resources in order to live. Now Prabhupada could see that this would be the future of our movement. So he said, build these farms. And also educate devotees on how they can become brahminically inclined, those who have kshatriya tendencies also, 
they should also be trained. And he wanted the whole social system as the foundation for the, uh, for the execution of Krishna consciousness. He said, We're, he said, I want to turn this whole world upside down. <laughs> I want to make a revolution and bring about the Vedic culture again. But in a more, you know, it can still be done even within the cities to some degree. But without all of the exploitation that city life has and all the pollution, it also comes along with it. Because the whole thing is based on a profit margin. But our idea is to serve Krishna, serve each other, and serve the world by providing both a spiritual knowledge and at the same time a lifestyle that is conducive to practice that spiritual knowledge. Of course, you can be Krishna consciousness anywhere, but for families it's very difficult to live in this Western society and practice Krishna consciousness. Therefore, Prabhupada said, community not nuclear families. Nuclear families, that's the creation of the Western capitalistic society in order to sell products. But just like there, Prabhupada was talking about there, how the whole society is so many problems and the scientists are all, you know, leading people in the wrong direction, giving a so one, so one devotee, it was actually Umapati, you can hear it on the tape. He said, yes, Prabhupada, this has been going on since time immemorial. Prabhupada said, no. Last 200 years, these rascal scientists come out. He said, before that, people were living properly. <laughs> it's only, only the last, since the Industrial Revolution, maybe 250, 300 years, that and the society is upside down with this Western soul-killing society that is simply raping the earth and exploiting people for as much as they can get. And as people live in the cities, they know that. And so, uh, so Prabhupada actually was very keen on awakening not only us, but the world in general to a more condu conducive lifestyle, not only for spirituality, but for, for healthier living. <laughs> And Prabhupada, I mean, Prabhupada was big on health. I mean, every letter that Prabhupada wrote, he signed it the same way. Hope this meets you in the best of health, your ever well-wisher, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. He was always concerned about the health of the devotees. And that's a big part of our society because Prabhupada said, keep good health, and that way you can serve Krishna nicely. <laughs> And if you eat right, and if you get good food, and if you can stay away from the, the, the media, <laughs> which is telling you what you need but really don't need, you can live a more sanguine or more sattvic life. So I'm, I'm mentioning all this because it's a very important part of Prabhupada's mission that needs to be done. And I was listening to Shiva Ram Maharaj Swami speaking just the... He's, he just recently gave a lecture. And he was also saying that we, Prabhupada wanted this Van Ashram, but we're not really making it an emphasis in our society. And he said, the farm, though, of course, the farm communities are the basis. It's happening to some degree, but not fast enough, and not, not, not in enough places also. So... Uh, and here, if we put more time, energy, in, and we can, we can supply everything that devotees need owned by our own farms. Everything is here. Everything. And Prabhupada said four things. He said, grow your own food. Grow, make your own cloth. He said, grow cotton, silk, make cloth. He said, the ladies will have something to do. <laughs> And then he said, he said, learn herbs and make men. And then he said, build your own homes. Take felled, fallen trees or dead trees or even some trees that are, you know, that are used, that, that are not used. They don't have any value, just like they don't produce any fruit or anything. And make houses. Build your own. When Prabhupada came to New Vrindavan in 19, 
76, I think it was. And he, he sat down with the devotees and he, and he drew on paper a house. He said, this is how you should live. <laughs> He's talking to us. We called it the Prabhupada house. <laughs> and it was just a little sketch that Prabhupada made. It was enough for a family of four like that. So he was showing us what we need to do in terms of building like that. All right, I don't want to take too much time. This is a really long and extensive subject, but I wanted to hit on this point just because I think it needs to be, a, again, and read Srila Prabhupada's books because if we really want to understand what is authority, we have to go to that authority. And the world is full of self-styled authorities nowadays. And sometimes you hear something and you think it's okay, but then when you re listen to Prabhupada, you ri realize it's different than what he said. So we should, t we should just like in the family, chastity is to follow according to the principles of marriage vows. So if you stay true to your marriage vows, it's considered to be chastity. So we stay true to Srila Prabhupada's teachings and his words and his directions for us as we understand it through his books and from his devotees who came in the line of Srila Prabhupada, who's teaching on behalf of Srila Prabhupada, and everything becomes easy. And ask questions. Get clarification. If you ever have any doubts, uh, it's mentioned doubts are like demons. If we don't, if we have any doubts, ask a question. Get your doubts cleared, because if you don't, doubts grow into something big, and they become big obstacles. Always clarify, and don't be afraid to ask questions. There's no stupid questions. <laughs> okay, I should stop here before, before it gets too late. Yes. Okay, we have a few hands. Yes. Hey, Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much for your wonderful class. I, I'll take challenging questions, too. Yeah. <laughs> so. So don't worry about that. You can challenge anything I said. Um, yeah, Maharaj, I was just wondering, based on this, because we hear it quite a bit nowadays, the importance of an ashram, um, what would your advice be on how to begin? What should be our starting point? What should we start to Agriculture. Prabhupada said agriculture. Grow enough food for everybody. That's it. As he said, Cal he said... He said, the cows will eat what the, what the human beings don't eat, whatever. He said, grow enough for both the animals and for the, and for the humans. Agriculture. People are doing that around the world now. Even some of our temples in the cities are putting little greenhouses in the temple or on the roof of their buildings to start growing like that. Because the food is so bad. To, you don't even know what you're getting in the supermarkets anymore in the markets, full of pesticides. Or, people are getting sick just by eating the wrong things. So agriculture, Prabhupada said agriculture is first. He said that's the basic need. Once you establish that, then you can build Van Ashram from there. You know. Yes. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, Rathi Yathra was very powerful. This, this year, this yeah. time, yes. Some, well, I've been to a few, but this was somehow it felt different. Um, it was what? Different. It felt. It, it, it was. Um, I, I don't know, but it, it was really uplifting, um, even for a moment. Engagement. I was smiling the whole time, yeah, and I yeah. usually don't do that. I, was, <laughs> I got it. My my my, yeah. my face got stuck with so, a smile. So, I was thinking, hmm. Yeah, I saw you. I guess I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I was smiling. I was thought, I don't know why. I guess I was. The atmosphere was so good. I think everybody was really into it, and it was the energy was really beautiful this year. And I think that's what attracted more and more people to take part. So, so Myra, I think I have a question. I'm leading up to it. So, so you mentioned uh, uh, farm communities, and um, and we feel now that if there was ever a time for farm communities probably would be now. Um, so Prabhupada was a visionary. Uh, he mentioned that in 50 years, everything will finish. Yeah, you, that's you, on you, record. Yes, I heard it myself. Yeah. Um, 
And, but there are also some, some information coming from other sources. Uh, you call them new ages or what have you, but maybe they is indicating the same thing, uh, saying the same thing. That um, they call it sometimes the Aquarius or the shift. Yeah. And, you know, and I wonder if it's the same thing they're referring to. We also have specific information from one source that states that in 2025, the divine kingdom arrives. I don't know if you know what that is. Uh, any, any information about that? It must be Lord Chaitanya's that? movement. Yeah. <laughs> and it will, last for, it will last for a thousand years of peace. Mm -hmm. But before that, but before, between now and then, it'll be mayhem. Yeah. And catastrophes. Right and now we're going things. through a dark era, and it's going to get darker. <laughs> and from the material point of view. But Prabhupada said, don't worry. He said, just chant Hare Krishna. So, he said, Krishna will protect you if you take shelter of the holy name. Yeah. So we, I get the impression that Prabhupada knew a lot more than he was telling us. He, he, being a visionary, of course, he didn't want oh, to scare Prabhupada, us. Yeah. Prabhupada said a lot of things that later on became you know, a reality. Prabhupada was an, a Shakta Vesharatar. He was sent by Krishna to do this work. So he was actually Lord Chaitanya's direct representative to spread Krishna consciousness around the world. He was empowered to do it, and he came on that mission. So that's why when he, when everything, he covered everything. You ask any question and you can find the answer in, somewhere in Prabhupada's books or in his lectures, yeah. But what you're saying has some truth, but people speculate about these in these different phases of how society is going. But there's one thing that is true, things will get darker for a while. That's the plan makers are making sure of that. And then but this will set the stage for Lord Chaitanya's movement to grow even faster. Mahaprabhu's movement is growing. It's growing by small but once the TOVP is finished, and then it'll really take a leap forward. <laughs> yeah, and that's in the Shastras. I mean, Lord Nityananda actually mentions that. that you know, once this bill, once this temple is built, they don't, then then the flood of love of God will really flow throughout the, the world. <laughs> that's a really important part of bringing Krishna consciousness to the world. But on an individual level, we need to organize our life in such a way that we don't get so much sucked into this Western society. And that's what's happening. Devotees are finding, they're finding it hard to practice Krishna consciousness because they have so much, so much responsibility in the Western world to educate children, to take care of children, to make a livelihood so they can maintain their family, transportation, everything. Everything is dependent on, on our present Western civilization. But Prabhupada said no. Just like in America, there is uh, these communities, just like the Amish. We went to see them and we spent some time with them. And they build their own homes and they build their own buildings. If they have to build a barn, the whole community comes together and they can build a, a, a full-size barn in three days. <laughs> they can build a house in one day. <laughs> so that's the power of community that's synchronized and like that. And we have it, we just need to put it together. And the lifestyle that is more, what we say, common is the basis for bringing that that's that energy into a more holistic, where we share labor and share resources, instead of everyone struggling individually to take care of their own individual families or needs. Prabhupada, community is the foundation for, for success. Both material and spiritual practices, you know. Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Maharaj, for your wonderful class. I like uh, many points you made, but this point in particular uh, about not only to understand trans transcendental knowledge, the last thing you said is uh, to make clear what it is, the cl clear, clear, the understanding. Yeah. Because there's so much, uh, there are so much definitions upon one word. 
So to clarify, you what get, you, you get clarified through discussions. Yes, and and the point I want to make is it's so important to really understand what's meant or with uh, with, with, with what you're reading because that's the Sambanda stage for the Sambanda stage. Uh, who am I? Who's God? What's my relationship? Right. Where do I go? So this, if that's clear, unless that's not clear, you can't go to the Abhideya stage. Yeah, right. And the Abhideya stage is how to apply it in your daily life. But yeah. for a good application, you need yeah, to understand. Yeah, what is my relationship with exactly. God? What is my relationship with the devotees? What is my yes. relationship with the spiritual master? Yeah. What is my relationship with the environment? Yeah. Yeah, so all of this is part of Sambandha. And Sambandha is foundational. Yes. And and without Sambandha, you're right, Yabhideya cannot be practiced c properly. Yes, know. it reminds me of how, many, how much time Prabhupada spent on just explaining, right. I'm not this body. Uh, some disciples said, oh, he's talking again about this bodily concept. But we can't live it still. Because it's you have really to keep hearing until you get it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, that's what the point. That, I yeah, want that's to make. why repetition is important because it's not a matter of just hearing it; it's a matter of, of understanding it and cultivating yeah. what you hear, and right. then you can do the abhideya. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, no, nice points. Thank you. This gentleman has his, his hand up. Actually, I had a question. Yeah, well, he's been raising his hand for, give it to him and then you can go next. Yeah. Mr. Mahara, it's a quick question, don't worry. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, you mentioned four things we need to do. To Prabhupada grow. said, yeah. The Prabhupada said four things. I pick up the third things one, but I missed the four grow words. Grow your own food, foods. make your own cloth, okay. learn herbs and make me your own medicines and build your own buildings, homes. Okay, I missed the herbs, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you. Krishna, uh, Elena wanted to ask you if Prabhupada wanted to reestablish the Varnashrams, why don't we see many Kshatriya in the movement today? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I I began uh, an effort to make Kshatriya Dharma happen back in 2013. We did it in Italy, and we got we got a little bit, but somehow the things fell apart, and there was some conflicts and. I don't want to get into the details. But that's a very big part because the Kshatriyas are both protectors and managers. And the, our society is, criti is criticized not so much for our knowledge. Our knowledge is good and devotees know things. But how we organize our life is somewhat needs to be developed. We're not so good at organization, although we're learning. It's a slow process. So there's where the, the Kshatriyas are. They're meant to be managers, organizers, and protectors also. So there are a large, and not large, but there is a, uh, quite a few people who are inclined to that dharma, and that, 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 uh, that uh, lifestyle, but they're not being engaged. That's unfortunate. So we're trying again to revive that again as an effort. But then in places like the Gurukul in uh, Mayapur, they're also having, they're also doing Kshatriya Dharma there to some degrees. Vrindavan also in other places. But we need it all around the world. Just like in one week in America, three of our temples were attacked by Dakites the this, this same week. It just happened in the same area. Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and one other area, temple in the same area. So unless we have people who are ready to defend, and Prabhupada, you can, you can go to it, uh, July 21st, 1973, Prabhupada's talking, he said, Vaishnavam, Vaishnavism is not cowardism. <laughs> He said, we have to learn how to fight also. And that's for the Kshatriyas in order to defend because the people attack. I mean, I was in New Vrindavan. We got attacked by that motorcycle gang. And, and then they, you know, they, they shot devotees and one devotee died later. They broke the temple. They broke the deities. 
So when Prabhupada heard about that, he immediately sent in one devotee who was a former Green Beret uh, in, the, in the Marines, who was, he was a fighter in Vietnam, and he came and we trained. We trained. We were doing marching calisthenics. We were learning how to fire rifles. This was in New Vrindavan. <laughs> I was there. I had just got out of the army because I spent four, almost four years in the army, and I was thinking, oh, my God. Back to the army again, I just don't <laughs> think. But Prabhupada wanted it. And we set up some kind of a defense system. And then after that, we had a lot less problems of being attacked. Because we knew Vrindavan was attacked so many times by the local area. It's a kind of a, like a, a very difficult area to develop a farm. So yeah, and many of our temples around the world have been attacked. But nothing so severe. In, uh, what's that place, Lithuania? They really attacked there and destroyed the whole temple. And the devotees got beaten really bad. They stole all the money. So there's been many ex examples or incidents around the world where our temples have been attacked like that. So, yeah. That's why we have these gates in front of the deities. That's one of the reasons we started that. That wasn't there in the beginning. Yeah, so that's that's important. Yeah. We we have to def be able to defend the devotees, the deities, the temples and our resources. It's all about defense, it's not about aggression. <laughs> yeah. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Sonia. Uh, what do you think, why, uh, what's blocking the Varnasham system to establish, to manifest? Why is it not happening? Yeah, well, what's blocking? There's other priorities that are, seem to be more important, or at least people who are in leadership positions don't see the importance of it. Many don't, but many do. And to and Prabhupada gave us the formula how to get do it. He said, first start Van Ashram College, and then train people according to a different partners. But we're not doing that. There's other priorities. And then you might say, well, what? Well, you know, different aspects of... Because there, our society is quite multifaceted and there's so many aspects to it. But um, I can't really say in a real clear way why we're not doing it, but we're not doing it. <laughs> Enough. And maybe the, the priorities are, that's not seen as a priority, but Prabhupada made it clear. And Shiva Ram made that point, just, Shiva Ram Maharaj made that point in his lecture just about 10 days ago when he said, yeah, uh, Prabhupada's established as Vainashram, but we're not doing it. Vainashram is the priority. He's, Prabhupada said, this is 50% of my mission. Prabhupada designed his mission in 1949 when he wrote the treatise called Gita Nagari Concept. And he based it on Gandhi's understanding of development. I mean, he made four parts. Holy books, um, holy books, holy names was the first part of which Gandhi also put. Then the, the, the Harijan movement was the, the process of educating people and bringing them to the standard of becoming initiated, opening temples. And then probably Gandhi's other part was village life and go back to the villages and make the villages self-sufficient. So Prabhupada took those four points and made it his pro. And if you read the seven, seven principles that establish ISKCON, the sixth one is there. This number six is, is to bring the devotees together in a more simple type lifestyle. That's number six. 
And Prabhupada based his whole movement on those seven principles. <laughs> so Prabhupada had a clear plan of what he wanted to do even before he got to America. But then he adjusted things according to what he was exposed to and what he saw, and learning about the Western civilization and trying to work with that. But the thing he kept pushing was Harinam and book distribution, especially book distribution. But then if you read his, if you hear his statements, he talked a lot about, you know, he talked about a lot about the importance of everything, but he talked a lot about a more simplified lifestyle. And he said, he says, we have to do it. And he said, if we establish these farms, when society falls apart, people will come to our farms looking for shelter, and we will engage them in Varna, not ashram. He says, once they're engaged in Varna, then we give them ashram. After they're in the, because if a person doesn't have a, a foundation on how to live, how can you really give them a spiritual life? You know, Livelihood is, is the foundation for people's existence. They have to have food, they have to have shelter, they have to have education, they have to have medical care. All of this has to be provided. And the way it's done in the present society, it's all franchise, it's all profit. I mean, you go to a doctor and even if he doesn't you know, help you, you still get a big bill. Of course, you have socialized medicine here, and, but in America, it's, it's hell. I mean, it's really hell. There's no socialized medicine. You buy Medicare, and you pay big money into that, and you use it once, and your premiums go up. People pay so much money for medical care. Here it's a little better. There's still, you still pay something here. But that's necessary. So in Vedic culture, the Brahmins would give medical advice and astrological advice, to, especially to the Grihastas. They would teach these two things, along with Divya, Brahma Jnana or Divya Jnana, transcendental knowledge. They would give this. They did it as a service, not as a as a opportunity for getting something. And people would re automatically respond by giving gifts to the Brahmins. So the Brahmins' livelihood was taken care of simply by people giving them in charity. And they would do. They would give knowledge. They would give medical advice. They would give ast astrological advice. Everything. Yeah. So this society that people think it's antiquated doesn't work, but this society doesn't work either. <laughs> it's definitely not work. It's mentioned, and Prabhupada mentions it. It's in the shastras also. There's a certain constellation that comes in the sky, it's called Swati. Have you heard of it? And it's a cosmological arrangement of the stars. It's called Swati. And it's a rare, when, when it rains on that at that time, the rain falls on the head of a snake, it becomes jewels. When it falls on the head of an elephant, it becomes gems and valuable stones. When it falls into the ocean, it becomes pearls, and that's taken by the oysters. <laughs> so that, these are, this is actually real wealth, precious metals. And it's actually coming from God it's through, through rain, many of it. And of course, it's embedded in the, in the environment also. You have gold, silver, and various things. So real wealth is not this paper money. <laughs> now it's plastic, right? Can't even hold it, it slips out of your hand. <laughs> <laughs> and if the government fails, just like I was in India in 19... 2017, and Modi pulled back all of the big bills in, in India, the big rupee f bills. And uh, he did that because the black market was so big. So anybody who had a, was it a 1,000 note, I think it was, and another... Uh, Five hundred, yeah. He pulled it all back, and all of that was useless. And if you had it, and you wanted to exchange it, you had to pro show some proof that that money was earned. Otherwise, they wouldn't give you anything for it. And people were burning money in the streets. 
So this paper money, is it's based on whether the government says yes or no. And if they say no, you're out. <laughs> yeah. So this, it's not real wealth. Real wealth is land, animals, especially cows, and uh, precious metals. That's, that's real wealth. Then you have something, <laughs> especially if you have land. Yeah. That's why we say get land, and then you have some equity. Yes. Uh, just a question. Uh, as a community, um, what kind of um, emphasis would you put that we should focus on for this particular time, for this particular year we're in? Is there a particular thing? Uh, um, we should emphasis really, uh, on? Yeah, just in general as a community. Well, um, my, my focus right now, I'm preaching two things, Harinam Sankirtan and farm communities. That's what I'm and Prabhupada said, It'll, the Harinam will purify the whole world. And, and not only Harinam, but creating environments where devotees are doing kirtan and inviting the public in. More and more people are chanting Hare Krishna than ever before from the outside. It's spreading. It's really working nicely. And then the social aspect, and that is, of course, read Srimad Bhagavatam. Read Srimad Bhagavatam. It's so important. Because all the knowledge you, you need is in Bhagavatam. Gita too, Gita's foundational, but Bhagavatam gives you everything. So I would say study Bhagavatam, distribute books, you know, spread the holy name, and see what it takes to organize. It has to come from the top to organize more communities. Of course, the devotees can do them themselves. They can get a piece of land with a few families and start some more of a simple lifestyle. I don't know. You'd have to buy land or get land somehow. But these, I think, are the most important things right now. <laughs> Especially, you know, the Hari Nam Sankirtan. That that's our that's where our Krishna consciousness is spread. And that in books book distribution. It's not like we need something new. <laughs> it's already there. We just have to emphasize that so deity worship is important. But deity worship cannot really sustain itself unless we actually propagate the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. <laughs> that will bring people in, is the chanting. <laughs> and Prashad. <laughs> Prabhupada said, make Prashad so good, they have to come back. <laughs> So it's our movement has so many aspects to it. But Prabhupada, right now I think the Van Ashram Dharma is the, and it's Daivi Van Ashram. It's not material Van Ashram. Daivi Van Ashram means you serve Krishna according to your propensity. That whether you are you're inclined to Brahminical services, Kshatriya service, Vaishya service, or just service in general. And so. What did I say? What happened? Thank you, Maharaj. I have a question. Actually, take the microphone because it's being recorded. Thank you, Edmina. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, actually, okay, I go home back to Holland today. Um, and to take with me the conclusion is like, actually, you say just continue with the process of Chaitanya uh, Mahaprabhu, the circle, that's a uh, the uh, good foundation, and at the same hand, it's a matter of reorganizing the society. Yeah, we that's, have that's we have to have some plan. Yeah, you know, this we uh, this Western soul killing lifestyle is not sustainable. Yeah. <laughs> but the problem is with the other one, the Sakirtan, We can do. We have in our own hands, and 
uh, what I mean, and of course, this Krishna is the ultimate controller, but to, to reorganize the society, you need the outer world and authorities and all these things, license and all these yeah. nonsense things. You, you can know? do it in a small increments with a few families, or you can do it as a, as a, as a yatra. It's done as a yatra, just like they're doing in New Rajadam, Gitanagri to some degree. Here is a, there's a nice basis here. You got some agriculture, but you have very good cow protection or cow care anyway. But it needs to be expanded where it can supply everyone and not only supply them um, of the needs, but the services too. Yeah. Why do we have to work for the Western, you know, society? I mean, if we can get all of our needs taken care of. And Prabhupada said you have to live simply. Not, it's not like poverty, but live according to your needs. You can still have cars, you can still have some of the amenities that go on in everyday life. But the basic thing is agriculture. Agriculture. Food is the first thing. Okay, I'm not going to end the class. If you just run out, that'll end the class. Because <laughs> it seems like if there's any more discussions, I'm here as long as... But if you, if you feel like you have to leave for prashadam or for some services, then please don't feel uncomfortable leaving. You can just... It's understandable. But we have another question. Yeah. Thank you, Marge. Um, I was wondering what books we should read uh, to find out about Varnashram in more detail. I just, I just put together a book. I have it. It's called Krishna's Way Natural Living. It's about 100 pages. So uh, anybody wants a copy, it's all about what I, my class is today. <laughs> it's a nice little book. It has a QR code in there where you can scan your phone, you can hear Prabhupada talking about how the society will collapse. <laughs> and it's all, he also talks about, you know, huh? <laughs> We're hoping it does. <laughs> uh, so yeah, anybody wants a copy of my book, it's, you know, it's just, a, I usually ask for like, Six pound donation, but if you don't have six, give five. If you don't have five, take the book anyway. <laughs> but anyone wants a copy, I have them where I'm staying in, in Watford. And, so. and uh, I'm here, and they can just contact me maybe through Raghupati or those who know Rishab. Or people know me, so that you can find, you know, and just give me contact me, and I'll arrange for you to get the book. Um, I'm bringing it to certain venues, just like tonight we have a program, and so I'll have the books there. So, like that. So, but. Uh, Hare Krishna Dasi, one of Srila Prabhupada's disciples, she also put together Van Ashram book. Mm. It's a beautiful book, and her whole thing is Van Ashram. She's also written articles about it, too. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Dasi. And you can find it through Srila Prabhupada's statements, and he speaks about it. Uh, I'll give you some verses if you want some verses. Srimad Bhagavatam verses. 1 8, 1 8 40 is one verse. First Canto, 8th chapter, verse 40. Another verse is First Canto, 10th chapter, verse 4 and 5. Uh, there's many verses. First Canto, 11th chapter, verse 12. 
These are all about Banashram. These are just a few of the verses. There are many more. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, yes. Elena, you want to say something? And none, and none importante. Fa subito. Yeah, that's the that's the the purpose of Vanashram College is to teach the different varnas and people will take classes and learn and then by learning you'll under, you'll get to understand both through the education and the evaluation system the incl your particular inclination, whether it's Brahminical, Kshatriya, Vaishya, or just in general, Sudra. Sudra means can do basic services, yeah. So that's that's the college that Prabhupada wanted us to establish. And that's another problem. We don't, we're not doing it. Uh, what was it? Radha Desh did it for a while, but then they stopped for some reason. I don't know. The problem is this particular aspect of Srila Prabhupada's mission has not been given enough importance by the leadership in our movement, and that's the problem. If they would give it more importance, then more devotees would get on board, I think. So we're trying to do it in whatever way we can. For example, I have seen a Brahmana transformation in a Kshatriya music, in a, in, in a particular situation. No, no, uh, no comprende. <laughs> You can have a mixed nature like that, yeah. Yeah, it's possible, but then it has to be clear, mm -hmm. like that. Just because you're passionate doesn't mean you're Kshatriya. <laughs> Could be a Sudra, too. <laughs> so, yeah, that the, the evaluation system helps to clarify the particular Varna. And the Brahmins are meant to teach and evaluate. Like Prabhupada was talking to one Gurukul teacher, and a Gurukul teacher was taking care of kids. And he said, there's one boy in the class, he, he, when it comes to learning, he doesn't want to learn, and he just causes trouble for the rest of the class. He's, we always have to reprimand him. And Prabhupada said, well, he's not meant for that education. Put him on the farm and give him some work to do. He's not Brahminically inclined. So, so that was an example. That even as you try to teach, then you have to see how people are accepting it. And, are, and those who accept it and, and, and actually use it, then you can evaluate based on, uh, you know, what they, how they accept. And therefore Prabhupada said, oh, you can hear it, and this is, those who want to hear more about this Van Arsham, it's a morning walk, March 14th, 1974, in Vrindavan. Prabhupada speaks the whole thing. Everything that I said, he's, he's done in a summary form in that lecture. March 14th, 1974, Vrindavan. And he's discussing with Ridainanda Maharaj. Ridainanda Maharaj is asking questions and Prabhupada's giving all the answers. 
And what Prabhupada says is that the collective society of Brahmins are the teachers and they teach all of the other varnas. Not that one Brahmin has to know everything. Brahmins can know a few things and then they teach the whole, the gamut of the different varna subject matters as a, as a group, not as an individual like that. They become the teachers. I spoke to one devotee and he said that um, staying in the Brahmacharya ashram helps you to find your nature, your varna more. Mm -hmm. um, that makes sense. It's supposed to help him facilitate. Yeah, and you get to learn after a while by trial and error. <laughs> okay. yeah. So would you suggest that we try a variety of different uh, services or how, how would we um, yeah. go about doing that? So? Well, that, uh, that depends on the leadership. There is the, there is certain service that are required to get done, and that has to be done. But the, those who are in leadership positions should train and educate people who are inclined to these different services. But then sometimes you can do many services. But then there will be a particular service that you really resonate with. And that that'll be somewhat indicating of your nature. You'll be not only you like to do it, but you'll be creative in, in doing it also. You all think of ways how to expand it, how to make it better. When you work according to your nature, just like you like kirtan, how you then you start thinking, learning with different melodies, and. Uh, you know, learning more d different types of instruments. Oh, you have a particular focus that is really resonating with your nature, and then you just become more creative and more interested in learning more about more and doing more of it also, like that. So that's how it works, you know. When you're doing deity worship, that's for medical service, and you think how to make it better, how to dress the deities nicer, think of new ways of how to improve the quality of the worship. And that shows that that person's inclined to that service, you yeah. know. If you just go over there and you do your service and you finish and you get off, I mean, that's nice. But there's those who really want to, you know, develop their service. And that's, that's the, that shows the inclination of the person. Yeah, but after a while, when you do two services that you like, after one, one will, one will become more prominent. <laughs> It'll come after some time. But then again, there's another point that we didn't mention. When you actually become purified, then you can do any service because you're fixed in the idea of service. Mm -hmm. But this, until we come to that stage of purification, then we have to get to that stage of purification, and that's why it helps to work according to your nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's this uh, Japanese um, word called ikigai. I don't know if you've... Mm -hmm. Ikigai. It's a, it's a concept in from Japan where to be happy you need these four things um, do you need to do these four things do things that are important in the world that the world needs uh, the thing that helps you to make money and I forgot the other two four things is a Japanese thing Kika is quite popular nowadays you know, well these are material things but that's based on that's based on material success really our success base is that our princip principle is to serve, serve in, in that way that you can actually 
offer your devotion to Krishna. And you're, if you're inclined to a particular service, you're more inclined to offer devotion in that service. But that's for, and, until you get to a stage of purification. When you get to purification, then whatever Krishna wants me to do, I'm ready to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you say that um, we try different kind of services and at some point we find something that resonates with us and that ultimately tells us that this is the varna we belong to. And yeah, every, Krishna says, Chaturbhanya Manashrista Guna Karma Vibhaga Saha. I've created these four types of living beings. Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shudras. They're there in a dormant stage. But they have to be brought out by education and, act, and, and activity. Yeah. And one thing I'm wondering, I don't know if it's correct, maybe you can tell me what you think. If we, because we know we are mostly controlled by the false ego right now in our conditioned state. Mm. So would that mean that, for example, if there is some specific resistances to do a particular service, there's a potential there because the like like There's the a resistance against working against uh, doing a particular service? Yeah, if we have a resistance to do a particular service, because it was the idea that the, con the false ego is controlling, is trying to block us. Yeah. To to the, would it be something like correct? Yeah, to that's why it has to be done under, under authority. Authority helps you to understand and to engage. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, we if we're always deciding what we want to do, when we want to do it, we'll just choose what we like to do. That doesn't mean it's our nature. <laughs> you know, we might like to eat pizza, but it may not be good for us. <laughs> so, so liking is an indication, but it's not the complete thing. You know, valuation and understanding it. That comes from education. That's why it, the scriptures say, Kalo Sudra Sambhavan. Everyone's born Sudra in this age of Kali. But people have these, these tendencies that are, that are there that need to be brought out through the educational system, which includes an evaluation system also. And that's what and Prabhupada understood that clearly. He said that's why we have to establish the Vanashram College train people accordingly. And then once you get the training, but right now when that training's there, we, you have to do a certain service, you do the service. Yeah. You do it in the, in the mood of, you know, trying to please Krishna, trying to follow the authorities. It becomes necessary. But what Prabhupada saw, and, and he, once he emphasized that people are serving, and they're also chanting, but they're going away because they're not working according to their nature. They're looking for something else, so they go outside and get a job. And that gives them more satisfaction. Yeah, so that false ego is there, but can be overcome by submitting to authority, and at the same time, the authorities are meant to put this program in, it, in place. The general body of devotees can. We ask to come. We have to establish these colleges. And you can hear from Prabhupada, he put a lot of emphasis on this. Especially if you listen to that lecture on March 14, 1974, in Vrindavan. That's, it's a more than an hour. It's a morning walk conversation. More than more than an hour. Yeah, that's what he's for. Yeah. And he mentions that in the in the in the scriptures, the spiritual master is meant to look at the at his disciples and see what is their inclination and engage them in that way. That's mentioned in the first canto. But a lot of times the dis disciples just do what they want to do, and you can't tell them what to do. <laughs> so it's like Kali Yuga. 
Yeah. So, but when we do, just like, for instance, everyone knows Johnny Kenath, right? He was here. So he would love just to do personal service for me. And I kept trying to pushing him out, knowing that he was meant for Brahminical work. He, his personal service was good in the beginning because he gave him a chance for training. But then I was always pushing him to go out and preach because I could see something in him that he could really help others. Finally, he got it and started doing it. When he did it, he did it in an exemplary way. But, yeah, it was my duty to give him that push because he was simply satisfied in doing personal service. <laughs> but I could see why, you know, that's nice at the, for a while, but he's meant for something more important. Preaching, in that case, like that. So, yeah, it's up to the spiritual masters to see, to evaluate, see his disciples, and try to engage them in that way. Okay. So, yeah. I guess you're hungry. Breakfast, yeah. 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 So, and I say you cannot live by philosophy alone. Take Prashad. <laughs> Shot to chanting, dancing, and and sleeping. Is it no chanting, dancing, and yeah, yeah and then and singing, chanting, dancing, eating, and then repeat it. Right, that's that T-shirt. Right, that's actually our philosophy, <laughs> and in practice. So thank you very much for your attention and enthusiasm. Hare Krishna. Jai Gopal Ki Jai.